Hi there, and welcome to the screencast on work and power. This is a screencast and a series of screencasts on the IB Physics core curriculum topic two, which is on mechanics. So in this screencast, we'll talk about work, its relationship to energy, and also power, that is mechanical power. So let's get started. So work in physics has a meaning different than what you might think in common everyday you know, language or usage. In physics, it's defined as a force applied over a distance or some displacement. So we have a force here and a displacement here, and that deserves a box. Now we must also mention that only part of the force that's in the direction of the motion contributes to work. So if you apply a force in the direction of the dis distance that it moves, that's great. But if it's not, well, not all that force contributes to the work. We'll see some examples of that in a, in a moment. The units, well, the force is in newtons. If distance here, or this displacement's uh, in meters, then we have a newton meter. That's also called a joule. Let's get an example, just a simple example here. Evelyn pushes her car with a force of 200 newtons to a gas station that's 30 meters directly ahead. How much work did she do? So if you want to work that out, you can pause your video. Okay, so this one's just a pretty straightforward example, right? Since the force in, is in the same direction as the motion, the work is just the product of the two. So 200 newton times 30 meters gives us 6,000 or 6 kilojoules. Let's take an example here where the force is not in the direction of the motion. Okay, here we can see the dog mowing the lawn. It's pushing with a force of 20 newtons downwards at this angle along the, uh, the handle. Well, the mower needs to go five meters straight ahead, forward. So the question is, is the amount of work getting to the shed, you know, those five meters straight ahead, is it less than, equal to, or greater than 100 joules? And we need to explain that. So if you want to try this one, pause your video, do so now. Okay, so what we have here, if we look at this force, this force is in this direction down here. We could break up this force into components. It has a downward component, straight down and a component horizontal. Well, this horizontal part of the force would be in the motion of the mower, and only this component, horizontal component, would contribute to the work. So if the F is 20 newtons, then this com horizontal component's gotta be less than 20. So something less than 20 times five is gotta be less than 100 joules. So the answer is less than 100 joules of work done. Here's a little more detailed example. Say we have a box and we apply a force at some angle angle theta, and we're going to start here, and we're going to move it to the, the right. The box is going to move to the right. Well, we can break up this force into components. It's got a vertical component down, and it's got a horizontal component. The horizontal component is given by the ma uh, magnitude of the force, or the hypotenuse here, times the cosine of the angle that we've defined. All right, so we need to, this vertical component is going to contribute nothing to the work, so it's going to go away. Only the horizontal component is going to contribute to the work. So we're going to move the box, and it moves over some distance here, or it's displaced amount s. So how much work is done here? It's going to be given by this. So we have force times the cosine of theta, that's our horizontal component, times the displacement. And it's usually just written this way. And the cosine of theta is at the end. So here's an example. Let's see if you can apply that. If you want to try and do this problem, you can pause your video. Okay, so what we have is a person pushing on a car at some downward angle like this. It's 10 degrees, pushing at 400 newtons, and it needs to go a distance of 15 meters, or it will go. How much work is the driver done here? Well, it's given by our equation. So with force times the distance times the cosine of the angle between it, well, the cosine of our 10 degrees is this right here. If we multiply all these together, we again get 6,000 joules. Okay, word about lifting an object. When you see a problem that involves lifting an object, well, a box has got some weight. Well, in order to lift this box, you need to overcome the weight. And when the lifting force equals the weight, right, the, the box will be in equilibrium. So when you ever see a problem, like you say, well, you have to lift this box and like move it up on top of something, what we really mean is right, the lifting force is equal to the weight. You can make that assumption. have an example here. You have a, a weightlifter. He lifts a 120 kilogram bar to a height of two and a half meters. How much work did he do? 
So if you want to try that and pause your video, do so now. Okay, so what we have here, we have the force due to gravity. That's the, the weight of this bar. We need to multiply the mass by gravity. If we assume gravity is 10, we get 1,200 newtons, the force due to gravity. And we know the work is given by the force times the distance moved. So we have a, a height here is 2.5 meters. So we multiply those two, we get 3,000 or 3 kilojoules. So let's notice something about this. Right? The work and energy, they share a common unit. That is the joule. Remember, energy had a unit of joule also. So we can conclude from that that they're they're okay they're different right work energy it's not exactly the same but they're very closely related let's see how so if we have this weightlifter remember he did work of uh, three kilojoules three thousand joules let's check out this this change in the gravitational potential energy of this this bar here when he lifted it well we know this is given by mgh well mass times gravity that's 1200 and the height is 2.5 meters that's also three kilojoules so the amount of gravitational potential energy, or the change, the amount it's gained, is equal to the work done. So we can conclude that doing work changes an object's energy somehow. This could be gravitational potential, it could be kinetic, it could be elastic, like when you're compressing a spring. Let's uh, look at an example of that. Here we have this car coming up a ramp, and the ramp is at different angles here. So we have different forces and different displacements here. Right, the card is rising more. So the displacement is greater, greatest here, but the, the force is less, right? It's easiest because it's it's going up at a slight slightest angle slighter angle. But the work in each case is exactly the same. So even though the angle of the ramp is different, the card is being raised to the same height in each case. In that case the amount of gravitational potential energy changed is the same. You can see by this little box in here. And so the work done on each is the same. Here's another example. We have a skier coming down and it's very common and convenient to use bar graphs to express uh, the different energies and energy transformation going on in a system. So here we have up at the top we have the skier. It had all gravitational. This should be gravitational potential if we're going to be nitpicky. We have kinetic energy here, we have work done. So we start off with a lot of gravitational potential, and as we come down, that's transformed into kinetic. At the bottom, we get down here, we're all kinetic, and we have some snow, which creates some, some friction, so we're going to slow down. So we see the work here, right? The force is, is backward, right? Slowing the person down, but the motion's forward. That's the opposite direction. So we're having actually negative work done here. And let's notice the total mechanical energy here. So the sum of the kinetic and potential at any time is is all one well, nine of these boxes I guess but once we start having some friction that starts doing some work and draining away this total mechanical energy and if we think about where this energy went it went into warming up the snow a little bit or warming up the skis maybe melting some of the snow so energy is conserved there so let's talk about work energy relationship a little more and how this can be used to help you when you're solving some problems. You can actually use it as a shortcut. Just have an example here. So I push a cart with a force of a half newton and I push it one meter along a horizontal track. So friction is low on these carts and uh, we can ignore it. How much kinetic energy does the cart gain? So I'll let you think about that a moment. If you want to pause your video, do so. Okay, well, notice we don't know the mass. It's not given. Kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. Well, there's, mass is not given anywhere. Neither is the velocity. But do we need to know those? Well, the answer turns out to be no, we don't. Let's check this out. The work done, we can calculate. Right? We have a force over a distance is a half a joule. Well, remember, work causes a change in an object's energy. In this case, it's going to be kinetic energy. If you imagine I push on something for a distance, it's going to go faster. So I've changed its energy somehow. What the work energy relationship says is that the amount of work done is equal to the change in the object's energy. So here, the work done is the change in kinetic energy or also a half a joule. So even though we don't know any mass or velocity, anything like that, 
we do know that the object's energy, the cart in this case, is energy changed by half a joule. Now if we know the mass, we can actually go back and calculate how fast it's going, or if we know the fast it's going, going we can go back and calculate its mass using that one-half mv squared relationship. Okay, we can also, remember we talked about how work can uh, go into uh, elastic energy. So if we have a spring, right, if I push on a spring and it's compressed or uh, a distance, we do, we do work on that. Well, it turns out there's, there's energy stored in that. So let's take an example for a spring. You know, it's nicely linear. We've seen this a little earlier. And the, right, the work done is the area under here. It's force times this distance. So if we take the area, so this is a triangle, so we need one half base times height. So one half, the height is F, the base is S. And we substitute in here, right, the, the force is given by some constant times the, the displacement, or the amount you compress it, which is S, the amount of, you know, the distance it's compressed. So if we simplify this, we get one half times the spring constant times the displacement squared. Well, this is the energy stored in that compressed, or if we happen to pull the spring, the stretched spring. Let's talk a second about mechanical power. Power is the rate at which work is done. So whenever you see rate, that means time is involved. In this case, it's defined as this. So power is work over time. So it's the rate at which work is done, work over time. And we could write it this way, right? Force times distance, or displacement is work. Time is on the bottom. Notice we have displacement over time. Well, that's velocity. So we could also write the power in terms of work and time, or we could write it in terms of force times velocity. And that deserves a box, too. The units here, well, if you have a joule per second, that's given a special name. It's a watt, after James Watt of the steam engine fame. Let's do the, an example here quickly. Um, remember Evelyn pushing her car. If she pushes her car to the gas station in 30 seconds, what's her power? So if you want to pause your video and try and work that out. Okay, well, her power is just, we remember she did uh, 6,000 joules of work. So power is that divided by the time. We have to change this to can't use kilo, we have to use joules here if we want the result to be in watts. So if we divide those two, we get 200 watts. Okay, that's your screencast on work and power. We'll see ya.